Hello, I see people joining. This is so exciting. Um, tonight, it's our four year run for something anniversary. It's National Run for Office Day. We are pumped. Uh, we're gonna give folks maybe two minutes to jump in. While you're joining, please make sure to introduce yourself in the chat. Make sure you change your settings to panelists and attendees. Let us know where you are, if you're running for office, if you're thinking about running for office. We're gonna be here to answer any of your questions. Um, uh, Get excited. I apologize in advance if you hear Sadie Dog squeaking in the background. <laughs> uh, we'll try and calm her down. Uh, that's just how we live now. We're going to give folks maybe two more minutes, 90 more seconds to jump in before we get started. We are so excited um, for tonight's event. I see uh, Rachel Suiza, uh, founder of Dare to Win from Brooklyn, Shirley Diaz, thinking about running for Nevada Assembly. That's amazing. Carrie Ann Nesbeth, candidate for City of Miramar Commission seat one. Recently endorsed, so excited, Carrie Ann. Um, Anna Escamani, who we'll be hearing from in a little bit. Uh, this is gonna be really fun. I'm excited. I am excited. I'm gonna learn how to say a word other than excited. Uh, we're gonna give folks another 30 seconds or so to join. Um, Ross, how are you feeling? I'm awesome. This is the best day. This is the best holiday of the year for my money every single year. I look forward to National Run for Office Day and I'm just super stoked to be here. I'm super stoked that it's also our four year anniversary uh, and in 21 years, we'll be able to run for Congress. I'm just excited all of you guys are joining. It's amazing. It's just, it's so, it is wild that we have made it to four years that we, what we have built together not just you and me, but the entire Run for Something team and every Run for Something supporter and candidate and volunteer and whether you have given us your time or your money or just like faved a tweet, it has all contributed to this, this incredible movement that is so much bigger than I know you or I could ever have imagined. So we'll get into a little bit on what we have built. Um, but first, I want to welcome folks who are just joining. My name is Amanda Littman. I am one of the co-founders of Run for Something. Uh, Below me or somewhere else on your screen is Ross Morales Riquetto, my uh, counterpart and incredible partner in this work. Um, our Run for Something team is scattered all across the country. Many of them are on the chat tonight. Um, so please do jump into the chat, introduce yourself, make sure to change your settings to panelists and attendees. Let us know where you're coming from and if you're thinking about running for office. If you're watching on Facebook, jump into the comments. We'll be keeping an eye there too. If you have any questions at all uh, for me, for Ross, for anyone on the Run for Something team, um, please do use the chat. If you have questions for our panelists during our conversation, use the Q&A function. It's just easier for us to sort through as we go. Um, I want to start by playing a little video from a wonderful, one of our top five uh, favorite Run for Something supporters who unfortunately was not able to join us live tonight, um, but wanted to share some best wishes. Hello everyone, I am thrilled to join all of you in celebrating one of the best holidays there is, National Run For Office Day. We're so proud to have Run For Something as one of the original partners of Onward Together, an organization I launched after the 2016 election to support people and groups on the front lines of our democracy. I still remember that first meeting with Amanda and Ross when we talked about an exciting idea they had. And look at what they've accomplished since. They've identified more than 65,000 young people who are interested in running for office and helped elect nearly 500. The majority of those candidates are women and people of color, and more than 20% are members of the LGBTQ community. Run for Something candidates and now office holders are changing the face of politics and government. Along the way, Run For Something has brought much needed attention to the local races that make such a big difference in people's lives. Campaigns for school boards and city councils and state legislatures and more. These last few weeks have been an important reminder of what and who we're up against. White supremacists, extremists, insurgents, terrorists, people who are working as hard as they can to undermine our democracy and our freedom. 
Those of us who believe in a very different vision for our country cannot afford to step off the main road, take our foot off the gas. We've got to keep focus on building a deep bench of candidates and winning at every level. And after all, we have a lot to celebrate, including the election of President Biden and Vice President Harris. But Run for Something has always understood there are no off years. So let's keep going. If you're watching this video, I hope you will consider running for office. And the Run for Something team is ready to help. Our country needs your passion, your drive, and your leadership. So congratulations, Run for Something, on four years, and here's to many, many more. Um, it is no exaggeration to say that Run for Something would not exist without Secretary Clinton, so we are so grateful for her to share that lovely message with us tonight. Um, for those of you who are new to the Run for Something family, I want to tell you a little bit about how we got started um, and what we've done over the last four years. Uh, Run for Something was born nearly four years ago to the day, and we launched on Inauguration Day that morning uh, with a little blurb and playbook and a website and a strategic plan that many of you might have read. It is no exaggeration to say that Ross and I thought this would be a side project. We thought we'd get maybe 100 people in the first year. You, you were managing a congressional campaign. I was like bumming around on my couch. We thought this would be a cool thing we do on weekends. In the first week, a thousand people signed up to tell us they want to run. And as of today, in fact, as of about six o'clock this afternoon, this evening, I guess, on the East Coast, um, more than 67,000 young people all across the country have raised their hands to run for office. That is beyond our wildest dreams. Like, I, I cannot emphasize this enough. We thought this would be a hobby. <laughs> So today to have more than 67,000 people say they wanna run for office and knowing that at any given point, 10% of them are actually on the ballot and knowing further still that many of them are not just thinking about 2021, but they're thinking about 2022 or 2025 or 2030. They're looking far off into the future. It is beautiful to see this movement of people who have said, I want to take charge. I want to lead, now help me. Uh, Run for Something has endorsed nearly 1,500 candidates in all 50 states, predominantly women and black and brown leaders and about 20% LGBTQ. And as Secretary Clinton noted, we've elected nearly 500, a majority women, a majority people of color and 21% LGBTQ. Those winners are across 45 states and you're gonna hear from some of them tonight. They are remarkable. They are scientists and urban planners and activists and Planned Parenthood staffers and uh, communications experts. And many that aren't on the call tonight are artists and musicians and rodeo stars and former Chipotle managers. They are people, honestly, a lot like you and like me, which means that we can do this too if we want to. I want to tell you a little bit about specifically what we did in the last year in 2020 when so much was going on. Um, when the pandemic began, Run for Something launched resourcesforcampaigns.com, which was a hub with materials for candidates trying to figure out how to run for office. More than 20,000 people visited that site. You may have been one of them. We ran an incredible series of events called the Armchair Chats, where Ross and I and members of our team talked one-on-one -on -one or one-on-two or one-on-three with experts in the industry. We streamed these on Facebook, much like tonight's events, and more than 2 million people watched these conversations and learned how do you run for office. In the last year, Run for Something gave out more than $200,000 directly to campaigns, including $100,000 to Black candidates running for local office all across the country. We sustained more than 100 partnerships. If you've been online today, you've probably seen some of our partners posting in our National Run for Office Day. We know we cannot do this work alone. Our team had more than 1,000 individual one-on-one -on -one conversations with endorsed candidates this year coaching them through every step of the process. We had a 45% win rate on election night with more than 525 candidates on the ballot. It's actually higher than our 2018 win rate. That's, that's amazing. <laughs> we have gotten so much better at this and the candidates we're working with are so much better. 
It is so cool that there are multiple run for something alum in 36 of the 99 state legislative chambers and on 28 different school boards and city councils and county boards. And that doesn't even count the folks who are like sharing in the same municipality at different levels of office. We have grown our pipeline, as I said, to more than 67,000. And the coolest part about that, more than 4,000, in fact, more than 5,000 of those folks signed up since election day. This wasn't about Trump and it's not going to be about Trump moving forward. It's about changing their communities for the better. Um, we are gonna grow that. <laughs> We're gonna keep growing that. And that's what National Run for Office Day is all about. People signing up to say they're thinking about running for office. And we're gonna keep working with folks really personally and meaningfully. Now, a little sneak preview to what we're focusing on this year in the next week or two we'll be rolling out a big detailed strategic plan um, but we have already endorsed 30 candidates for 2021 we expect to endorse more than 400 this year we're going to really be keeping our eyes on local and municipal offices um, one because their roles in passing really meaningful policy are incredibly important as we've seen in the conversations around the pandemic and healthcare and police brutality and because we want to build a really good bench of democrats for moving forward some of the people you're gonna see on the call tonight, some of our alumni, one is already running for governor. I would expect at least two more to be running for higher office in the next two years, just, just a thought. Um, and we know that if we don't compete for these local races, the worst Republicans will. Even if Trump is never on the ballot again, which God willing, he won't be, nor any of his kids or daughters or wives or what have you, uh, Trump Republicans are. And we know that because more than a dozen state legislators, Republican state legislators participated in the insurrection, a dozen more school board and city council and other local electeds participated in similar kinds of uprisings in their states or in DC. The party is rotten all the way to the core. And we, as Run For Something, are committed to helping fumigate. Uh, we have 17 state targets over the next two years based on where municipal elections are and where opportunity is. And we'll be putting all of this out in detail in the next couple of weeks. The best thing that you can do if you're on this call tonight is one, run for office. Run for office, run for office, run for office. If you're thinking about it, we wanna help you. Uh, you can sign up at runforwhat.net, runforofficeday.com. Any of those places will take you to the same source, which is where you can enter your address and look up the offices available for you. If you're not thinking about running just yet, or you're not sure, one, you should still sign up. You'll get materials. It's not a promise. It's just saying you're interested, but two, you should recommend a friend to run or should sign up to help. Our volunteers are a critical part of this operation. They're how we've been able to scale this. And so many folks on this call tonight have been part of that volunteer team. So please, please, please sign up. Third thing you can do if you have the capacity is please contribute. Run for Something has done all of this while spending barely $2 million a year if you average it out. Our budget for 2021, the bare bones that lets us keep doing this work at the scale we have been is about 3.2 million. I cannot say enough how grateful we are for every single dollar, whether it's one, five, 500, 500,000, whatever it is that you are able to give, especially if you can make it recurring, it means the world to us. And especially if you're able to join our national host committee, uh, which Robert from our team will drop the link into the chat right now and be a sponsor for the rest of our events this year. That would be incredible. That's how we're able to keep these things free. And hopefully by later this year, God willing, we'll be able to do events in person. And when we do, you'll be invited to those as well. But for now, as a national host committee member, you're ensuring that we're able to put on some of the, what I would say best in class virtual events in the field. Um, with that, I am so excited to toss it over to my partner in not crime, uh, Ross Morales Riquetto to introduce our panel, Ross. Thanks, Amanda, and thanks again, everyone, for being on. <clears throat> really appreciate it. Um, I have the honor uh, of getting to introduce our next panel, uh, who, with a bunch of Rum for Something alum, uh, who are just super amazing people. Um, first, our moderator for the panel uh, is State Representative Malcolm Kenyatta, who represents Philadelphia. He's amazing. Um, he was uh, an endorsed candidate back in 2018. Uh, we endorsed him again in 2020. Uh, and we all know, uh, anyone who knows Malcolm and after this call today, you'll know, uh, he has a bright future in Pennsylvania state politics, probably uh, at the statewide level. So uh, welcome Malcolm. Uh, we also have uh, Nithya Raman, who uh, is a city council member in Los Angeles. Um, this she's, this is, she's, I 
the race that she ran was really incredible this last cycle uh, in 2020. She took out a pretty long time incumbent uh, in that district uh, and is bringing like real representation to the constituents uh, who live there. So really excited to have you on. Uh, and then we have State Senator Sarah McBride, uh, who, uh, you know, I just uh, right before we joined the call, uh, we watched uh, President-elect and then tomorrow pres uh, President Joe Biden uh, say his uh, pr pretty heartfelt goodbye to Delaware for a while. Um, she's a state senator uh, in the state of Delaware. Uh, she is amazing and has been involved um, in both national and local issues for years and years. She's also the first uh, trans state senator in the nation. And so with that, uh, you didn't come here to listen to me talk. You came here to listen to these amazing folks. Uh, I'm going to kick it over to Malcolm to facilitate uh, this discussion, and uh, I'm excited to watch. So thanks, y'all. First of all, thank you so much, Ross and Amanda. Um, you know, talk about needing better hobbies. If this was a hobby, then like I need to get beyond just watching Great British Bake Off because what you all have been able to do has been actually meaningful in the world. And I say, you know, to anybody who will listen, hands down, without a doubt, that I would not be an elected official if it had not been for run for something. When people were still questioning whether a poor black gay kid could win an office in Pennsylvania, run for something said, not only do we believe you can win, but we're gonna help you win. And you will hear me say this probably a couple of times throughout this call and more if you follow me on any social media, that bravery really begets bravery. And when folks step up to run, what it does is it shows other people that it's possible. And so the two women who we have with us on this, on this short panel today are folks who exemplify what it looks like when you are brave and when you step up and run. And so I wanna jump right into it because I know we have a limited amount of time and I have more questions than we have time for. So Nathia, so first of all, I just wanna say you're amazing. My better half is from California. And so he loves you. <laughs> he's not home right now, but when I told him I was gonna be on a call with you, he's very excited. He loves California yeah. and he loves what you did. And so let me, let me start with this question. If you have somebody right now who's listening, who wants to do what you did, who wants to launch a campaign against an incumbent, where should they start? Well, you know, I've been um, thinking about this a lot since uh, since I agreed to do this event. And first of all, I just should say thank you to Run for Something for your endorsement um, early in my race, and. Anytime I had a question, I was able to call on Run for Something for support. So any prospective candidates who are in the chat, who are watching this event, um, running is very lonely. And as a, it can be, especially as a candidate, can be particularly lonely because it's your name, it's your face out there. And Run for Something, the community that it creates, I think really helps to take away some of that loneliness. And they're always there for you if you have a resource. So I'm very grateful to this community and and. Um, you know how it is, <laughs> everyone else on this panel. So um, yeah, so so very, very grateful to be here as well. If I were to look at somebody who was thinking about challenging an incumbent, I think the most important thing to do right in the beginning is to articulate very clearly how you would be different from that incumbent. You have to make it very clear what you would do differently, how you would use the powers of that office differently from that person who's in power right now, and really be able to tell that story to anyone who's listening, because that is how you win, not just supporters or votes, but how you win the thing that's going to get you to the finish line, which is volunteers who are going to make the calls, knock on the doors, send out the postcards, uh, do all of the things that actually help you to turn turn uh, um, uh, someone who's who doesn't know anything about the race or who has already you know has mildly heard of the incumbent into a passionate supporter of yours, um, and so really being able to articulate what am I going to bring to this seat? What am I going to bring to this candidacy? What am I going to bring to this role? What are the powers of the office that have been underutilized? What is my vision for this change, and how does it look different from what's been done before? getting really good at telling that story and using every platform you have at your disposal to tell that story, I think is really the first thing that I would recommend that people do. So thank you so much for that. A really, really 
uh, good answer, and I hope people were taking a little bit of notes here. Um, one of the notes that I was taking was that when Amanda was speaking about the types of candidates that run for something has supported who've, who've won. She talked about um, how many women and people of color and LGBTQ folks um, have won their elections. And, you know, I often think that America doesn't, and our government doesn't serve everybody because a lot of people are not represented in our government. Um, Sarah, you have changed that with your election. You got a lot of media attention. This was a historic win for a lot of reasons. How did it feel to win a tough election and then to also have you know, the monumental impact on top of that? Well, first off, it's so great to, to be in conversation with both of you. Um, Nathai, congratulations on, on your win. And, and Malcolm, it's so good to see you again. I was actually just on Facebook the other day, scrolling through, and I came across the picture of the two of us outside the Democratic National mm -hmm. Convention in 2016. Um, oh. So it's, it's, it's just such a privilege watching your, your career. And I can't wait to, to see you in statewide office in Pennsylvania. Um, you know, I, I think it's it's interesting because on the day to day of the campaign, you're not thinking about your 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 identity. You're not thinking about the 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 headlines that might come. You're thinking about the nuts and bolts of the campaign. You're thinking about talking to as many voters as possible, and you're thinking about the issues that they're bringing up every single day on, you know, either the doors or once we hit the the pandemic over the phones. But then, of course, every once in a while someone will say something, or in particular, a young LGBTQ kid would, would send me a, a video or a message to say how much it meant to them seeing someone like them running for office. And then after um, November, getting those messages saying how much it means to them seeing someone like them win and serve in public office, you're reminded of the, 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 the opportunity and the responsibility that comes with being a first. Um, a lot of times we talk about diversity in government and the, and the symbolism and the message, but, but Malcolm, to your point, diversity in government isn't just about symbolism. It isn't just about messages. It's a necessity in a democracy because you can't craft effective solutions for diverse communities if you don't have the full diversity of those communities at the table. That's true in technology, in business, and it's certainly true in public policy and in government. And so I know that, that with the greater diversity we have in our General Assembly here in Delaware this year, the most diverse legislature in our history, in thanks to organizations like Run for Something, which supported so many candidates here in Delaware who ran and who won, I think we're, we've never been better positioned to meet the scope and the scale of the challenges we face. But ultimately, being a first doesn't matter if you're also the last. And so as I enter this office, I got sworn in last week, one of the things that's, that's top of mind for me is to not leave a Sarah-sized hole in the wall, to, to utilize the, the, the responsibilities of the office, to not just leave a hole in the wall, but to help bring that wall down, help remove the barriers that keep all of us from having an equal say and an equal role in our government. Um, and, and, and hopefully in, in two years at the end of my first term, uh, it, it won't be my identity that's top of mind for folks. It's what I've, it, hopefully it'll be what I've been able to do and the barriers and, and, and the, the obstacles that I've helped bring down for other people. Sarah, thank you for that. And, and obviously I've known you for many years, but you know, watching your race from right across the whole water here um, was, so, was so inspirational. Um, you know, Nathia, you got sworn in really quickly after winning. Um, one of my favorite questions when I first get to meet people like we're meeting is what is the biggest surprise you've had so far now being in the job? Yeah, well, I did get sworn in really fast. Um, and it, in the history of Los Angeles, there haven't been many times when someone who doesn't have a lot of political experience uh, like me has actually won a race against an incumbent or has won, it has really won off, taken office like this. So this is not just one of the shortest transition periods because of a change in election timings, but it's also one of the most more unusual ones because I'm coming in with less experience with the, you know, the running of a government office than a lot of people who are in this role traditionally. But I think what has been surprising for me in the past few weeks is how much the skills I learned on the campaign and honed on the campaign have come in handy already. And how much of it 
really has to do with the nuts and bolts of just building a great team, building processes that really work uh, to respond to constituent issues, making sure lines of communications are clear, making sure that you are prepared to take on, you know, the agenda of the week and, and you're building, building the kind of skills that you need in order to be able to take it on. I mean, that, it, you know, it, in many ways, it, it's exactly what we did in the campaign. Every time that we saw a new area of work that we needed to work on when COVID prevented us from being able to go out and knock on doors, we knew had, we had to build a digital fundraising and outreach operation. And so we brought those skills onto the team and we're still continuing to do that in the office. And it's been nice to know that despite how fast this transition was and how overwhelming all of this is in some ways, um, especially coming into it at this moment in history, which you know LA County has some of the worst COVID numbers in all of America right now, it's, it's really um, a difficult, difficult period for Los Angeles. Um, it's still, I think, good to know that we have the skills that we can draw on and a track record that we can draw on to be able to take on um, the challenges of the office. You know, thank you for saying that and being honest about some of the challenges, because I think a part of what a problem is and what makes running for something feel so scary is that you only get the beginning of the story and the end of the story. They decided to run, they won, right? And none of the anxiety and everything else that's, that comes in the middle, the majority of the story. Um, and so, Sarah, you were on with some other people who I deeply admire and deeply respect on Run For Something's podcast. Plug for the Run For Something podcast on all the places you get your podcast. Um, <laughs> you're on with Brianna and Danica, um, two other Run For Something alums who are just barrier breakers and table shakers who won historic elections. And obviously you ran on a bunch of issues aside from who you were um, and who you are, but there are a lot of people who are queer like us who don't run because being queer and running for office is so, so scary. I mean, you remember in my race, the people put up the hateful flyers and everything else. And I know you had people and you have some epic Twitter clapbacks with people who had things to say about you. And so what do you think Run For Something has done specifically that really helped pave the way for folks in the LGBTQI plus community um, that really gave you the courage to run and win? Still making that mistake eight months in. Um, it, it's such a great question. Um, and, and, you're, and, and the way you asked it, I think is, is so important too, because one of the things that I think people don't realize is when they, when they watch someone run for office, they don't see the anxiety behind the scenes. They don't see the, the tears. They don't see the moments where you question yourself. Um, and, and those are real and, and they're common. We, I think we all certainly um, struggle with them from time to time. And when you're an LGBTQ candidate, there's certainly extra challenges. When you're a candidate of any marginalized background, there's certainly extra challenges. Um, to your point, our, our, our opponents and, and those who are working against us used anti-LGBTQ tropes, I think, in both of, of our races. And really run for something was such an integral part of my campaign from start to finish. So one, run for something's willingness to challenge who is electable and to invest and support candidates early on, long before can organizations that are, that are, are, are oftentimes sort of sit back and, and, and wait to get involved until they, they know for sure that this person's gonna win, run for something's early investment in candidates of marginalized backgrounds or willingness to, to put their necks out there for, for candidates who will make our government better and stronger and, and more inclusive, that goes a long way. Um, and when you're just starting out, having that early support, having that early guidance is critical. For, for me, run for something, putting me in touch with, with other trans candidates and other trans elected officials was key. Um, I certainly knew some of them before through my own advocacy like Danica, but the mentorship program was so helpful as I navigated how to interact with these attacks on my identity that came my way. But then beyond that, every candidate struggles with, with similar things. And this year, so many of us struggled through the pandemic, figuring out how to reach voters and run for something more than any other organization helped me. And I know so many others 
adapt to that new environment to make sure that we were protecting the public health while campaigning to ensure that we were reaching voters where they are safely and responsibly to model the kind of behavior we wanted to see from other people as candidates and, and run for something we never would have been able to adapt and to adapt as quickly as we did if it weren't for run for something in their guidance. Thank, thank you both. And I have one final question that I'd like to direct at both of you. And because I'm usually on panels and not moderating them, I'm gonna break my own rule and answer the question before you answer. But, but my question is, what is your best advice for somebody who's considering running for office? My advice is one word, run, because you miss 100% of the shots you don't take. So my advice is run. What say you? Whoever, just jump in, whoever wants to. Um, I can go first. I'll say uh, find your community. Uh, and I want to go back to what I said before. I think running can be really lonely. But if you can find a group of people in your jurisdiction, in your geography that shares your values and that shares your passion for change, it can really feel like something uplifting. Senator? In addition to what I mentioned earlier, which is to, to understand that, that everyone struggles with that anxiety, everyone struggles with that voice in the back of their head that, that tells them that they aren't qualified, that, um, that, that tells them that it's not their time, um, to, to recognize that that voice, those questions, they aren't a sign that you shouldn't run. And they are common, they are not the exception, that, that the people that you're seeing run, they struggle with those questions too. Um, but more than that, I think one of the things I have learned through my advocacy and certainly running for office is that the only things that are truly impossible are the things we don't try. And that the only complete limitation on our dreams is our own limitation of our own imagination. And so I just hope people know that no matter who you are, no matter what you look like, no matter what, where you live, um, that your dreams and your identities are not mutually exclusive. And we have it in our collective and individual capacity to bring about seemingly impossible change. And that includes more young people of every background at the table in public office. Well, I'm, I'm just truly, I just wanna start where I ended um, with just saying I'm truly inspired by you both Thank you for running as your authentic selves. Thank you for winning and inspiring other people. And so with that, I'll turn it back over to Run For Something co-founder, Amanda. Oh my God, that was so beautiful. Nithya, Sarah, Malcolm, you guys are so inspiring and powerful. And I, Run For Something is so glad to be on each of your teams and we're with you, whatever comes next, whether formally or informally, we are so aggressively on your side in a way you're going to find really annoying by the end. <laughs> um, thank you all three of you for joining us and Malcolm for that stellar moderation. I think you guys will zoom away momentarily um, and we will bring up our next panel three, excuse me, four women. I feel honored and privileged to count as uh, friends in this crazy, crazy world. Um, you're going to hear from next from uh, New York State Senator Alessandra Biaggi um, from the Bronx slash Westchester. Um, Alessandra won a tough primary against a IDC member of the New York Democratic Party. So someone who was caucusing with Republicans and giving control uh, of the state Senate to Republicans accordingly. Back in 2018, she flipped that seat from fake Republican to real Democrat. Uh, you'll also hear from a uh, Former member of the Virginia House of Delegates, Jennifer Carroll Foy, current candidate for governor of Virginia. Um, Gemma is one of the first African-American women to graduate from the Virginia Military Institute. She's a foster mom, a magistrate judge, and a public defender. Uh, she's now the mom to two wonderful twins, uh, one set of twins, two kids. <laughs> um, she led Virginia's effort to ratify the Equal Rights Amendment, passed legislation to combat the state's teacher shortage, and proudly supported the fight to expand Medicaid. Um, if she wins the campaign to be the next governor of Virginia, she'll be the first Black woman governor in America. You're also going to meet Anna Escamani. Anna Escamani is a Florida state representative from District 47, uh, right near Orlando, where she was born and raised. Um, she's the daughter of working class immigrants who came to Florida from Iran. Uh, she went to public schools in the county and the University of Central Florida. She flipped her seat in 2018, red to blue, then won her reelection in 2020, and including winning a couple precincts and neighborhoods that Trump won at the same time. 
She made history as the first Iranian American elected to any public office in Florida. She has made a name for herself as a fierce progressive uh, fighting for economic justice, environmental protection, women's right to choose and supporting arts and culture. Ada is going to be a queen of the world, but more, more soon uh, if we have our way governor of Florida in the hopefully near future. Um, I am also thrilled to have Mari Manugian. Mari Manugian is one of the, uh, Michigan State Representative from District 40. Um, she was born and raised in Birmingham and is serving her second term. She just won re-election, uh, representing the 40th district. She currently serves as Assistant Minority Whip for the House Democrats. Um, she's the youngest woman serving in the 100th legislature and is the first Armenian American woman to serve in the Michigan State House. Uh, she should be joining shortly. So we're gonna get started in this conversation and hopefully Lamar is able to make it amazing. Alessandra, Anna, Jen, I am so excited. This is just my favorite group of people. Um, <laughs> <laughs> I wanna start with Alessandra and Anna as current uh, leaders the current elected officials in state legislatures. I want to know a little bit, how have you been balancing the pandemic, um, the racial uprisings, um, running for re-election and winning? Um, wait, Alessandra, you want to go first? <laughs> oh, I don't think I can hear you. Mm -mm. Okay, Anna, why don't you go ahead? <laughs> Is my audio okay? Can y'all hear me? Awesome. Hi, everyone. Thanks so much, Run for Something, for hosting us and for bringing us all together on this incredible Run National Run for Something day, but also your four year anniversary. I don't know where I would be if it wasn't for Run for Something, and I certainly would not be elected official. Um, for those tuning in, Run for Something was the first organization that endorsed me and really pushed me to run. And so like the, the previous panelists shared, it can be tough running for office and having a community of support is a really big deal. So to the heart of your question, Amanda, oh my goodness, I have no work-life balance, it's like at all. And I always try to refer to it as a personal ecology, meaning that for each one of us, we have to find like that that day-to-day -day groove that meets where we are in this moment of time. And for me, it's, it's very much a combination of, um, of, of constant hustle, um, but also delegation, like getting a lot better at, at, at delegating tasks and, and you know, realizing that you don't have to do everything by yourself. If you, you can, you could even do a, a pieces of it to then disperse to your team, right? And then reconvene to finish that project. So super blessed to have an incredible team. And we do have a, um, we call it the Anaverse <laughs> here in Central Florida. It was our volunteer team that brought us to victory in 2018 and in 2020. Um, and as you mentioned, you know, we won two precincts that went to President Trump and that was an, no, no easy task. And I think it was very much a combination of two things. One is we were on the ground um, safely. We were on the ground. We made phone calls to our district but not necessarily calling for votes. We were calling to check up on people and we actually did wellness checks. And so we were able to uh, mobilize our volunteer base instead of campaigning to just do constituent services for the pandemic. And in particular, unemployment for us became a major issue. And as, as of today, our office has helped more than 30,000 unemployment claims um, get paid. And actually I have a lot of emails to get through tonight for unemployment issues, but it is definitely a part of our work is, is giving up transactional politics and really focusing on what's transformational. Can you hear me now? Yay, amazing. Okay, I am so excited to be here with everybody today. And also congratulations to Run For Something. For everyone who's watching, I just wanna be very clear. I would not be here. And by here, I don't mean literally in my living room, but I mean here as a state senator, um, especially in the race that I ran in, if it were not for Run For Something's courage and commitment to really making sure that our government is represented by people who actually care. And I, you know, uh, everything that you said is exactly right. I think that when I, when I was thinking about reelection, I really almost wasn't because of the incredible need that was 
happening on the ground. Now, I represent the Bronx. The Bronx, just to reorient everyone, is literally the epicenter of the epicenter of the COVID-19 pandemic. And before the pandemic, it was a place where people were sick and lived with comorbidities like heart disease and asthma and diabetes in rates that were just so far exceeding the national average. And so when COVID hit, it became our number one focus, but more importantly, people's basic needs like eating and food became almost predominantly, in addition to unemployment, because that was a huge um, issue in the state of New York, mainly because of technology, but we'll get to that probably later. Um, feeding people became this huge um, undertaking and we were able to feed over 200,000 people and, and serve over 200,000 meals. And I know that that number sounds like a lot, but I'm just gonna tell you, I represent 330,000 people. 200,000 meals is like a crumb in the bucket. It's not even a day's worth of food. So the, just the incredible amount of need has just exacerbated because of this, this moment that we're in. And so being on the ground, being responsible and receptive, um, I was the first legislative office to go remote during the pandemic. Um, politics aside, I think that it really wasn't taken as seriously in the state of New York as early as it should have been. And so it was this incredible moment for me in the beginning of the pandemic where I had to do something on my own because my other colleagues were just not shutting down their offices and didn't even think we needed to close the Capitol. And so I really endeavored upon a journey of, okay, we're gonna do this, make this decision. Later, of course, other people did close their offices and go remote, but the point was we created a an archetype of what it would look like to actually have remote offices in government, which is a very unusual thing, as you know, because constituents like to come through the door and have their cases be met with you know, live people who are on your team and we just couldn't do that. And so that was, again, the beginning of this journey for me where I felt like I was making decisions that we had never made in the state of New York before, a lot of new territory, a lot of trusting myself. And what I realized at the end of the election cycle, honestly, was that really what is supposed to probably always be the way it is, which is that the work is the thing that will get you reelected. And yes, you have to campaign and yes, you have to be out there and do all the things you need to do. But if you are showing up for the communities that you represent, they will remember you. And not only will they remember you, they will feel like they like they are heard, which is such a huge reason why so many of us have run because a lot of people have felt like they've been left out. And so that combined with just the criminal justice reform and police brutality and all of the things that we dealt with in the state of New York and the city of New York um, converged in a way that allowed this opening for voices that had really not been heard as loudly as they needed to be. And it was a remarkable moment because we passed incredible legislation called the repeal of 50A, which allows for transparency into um, police records. And we did it in an election year. And we did it in an election year, which is unusual to do something like that because of how many people were not only conscious, but were marching and were demanding it. And so showing up to those demands was just an incredible moment. But the convergence of all of those things and, and actually being responsive, I believe is the reason why I got reelected in 2020, which is amazing. And, and of course, in addition to having run for some things help because it goes a very, very, very long way. Mari, how about you? How did you survive the last year? <laughs> how are you doing? Um, I'm good. Um, a lot of, uh, you know, Zooms with friends and, um, you know, trying to, you know, keep up with my regular schedule as best I could and getting out of bed in the morning at, a, at the same time every day was really helpful. Um, but, you know, it's just, it was a really, um, I will say this, being a younger elected official, the sort of blessing in disguise with all of this for us was it was such an easy transition to digital in a lot of ways and definitely a lot easier for me um, as sort of a digital native than it was for some of my colleagues. And so um, one of the things I made sure to be helpful with in our caucus was to help people sort of transition themselves to as many digital platforms as possible, um, helping some of our older members set up Facebook pages for the first time, that sort of thing. Um, and it's something that um, I'm excited to keep doing, honestly, because I think it's really important that we meet our constituents where they are and increasingly it's on these digital platforms. Um, so that's something that, you know, was a big shift, obviously, for everybody on this call, um, both campaign side and on the state side. 
Um, and it's something that I think we did pretty effectively um, in my uh, time, you know, both running for office and then, of course, serving at the same time. Um, I represent an area of Metro Detroit that is traditionally a Republican um, district. It was I flipped it in 2018. Um, and in 2020, we um, increased our margins here by about 3%. So we won um, by over 10,000 votes, which was awesome. Um, and I think a lot of that is a testament to the work that my team and I have been doing since um, we were you know, running for office the first uh, time. And then, of course, in 2019, we um, knocked another 15,000 doors in the off year to touch base with people. Uh, we handed out surveys. People mailed those surveys back to us to make sure that we were talking about all the things that really mattered. Um, and then, of course, just showing up in the community. I mean, for many, many, many years, this district was represented by Republicans. And so uh, it often just kind of meant phoning it in. And, um, you know, we had, you know, some very nice people that I have met and worked with now in new capacities that represent this district. But, um, you know, even just today, I had a call with a local elected official. We're doing our regular yearly, um, you know, just basic check ins. And then we do them more frequently as things come up. Um, and he literally said, like, no one, this is the first time that a state rep or state senator has ever called me to just check in to see how I was doing and see, like, if there was anything I needed. Um, and so doing these things was really important to us, um, you know, to just have a good connection and pulse on what's happening in the community locally. I can't be everywhere. Um, and we do the best that we can to represent all 100,000 of our constituents. Um, I think with regard to, like, you know, uh, kind of juggling being in a flip district and all of the sort of questions of unrest and sort of divisiveness, which like I don't, either you're for democracy or not. Um, but to kind of like bridge that divide in our community, I mean, the best thing that we, I think we did during the pandemic and um, we will continue to do is just continue having sort of roundtable discussions with constituents and showing up um, when it matters. So. Um, you know, we proudly marched in my majority white district for Black Lives. That was really, really important to um, particularly the students at our public high schools who organized many of these marches. Um, we continue to speak with those students today about police reform uh, bill packages that exist in the Michigan House. That's super important. Um, but also, you know, we have um, many of our restaurants here are still closed to indoor dining and, and it's a huge issue for our community. Um, and so we continue to have those like round tables with our small business owners um, just to keep that going. Um, I am so impressed by all three of you, especially given how um, unsafe some of the state capitals have felt over the last year that you've kept showing up and doing the work. It has been really remarkable to see and made us really proud. Um, Jen, you were doing the same up until about three weeks ago when you stepped down from your uh, role in the Virginia House of Delegates to commit full time to your campaign for governor. How is your campaign for governor different than the first time you ran in 2017 or in 2019? What's, what's the same and what's changed? Yeah, that's a great question. So first, thank you for having me. I'm honored to be here. Um, and I have to say in 2017, uh, unlike 20. 17 first, I'm not pregnant with twins, so that helps. Um, I do not suggest running for office uh, while pregnant um, with twins at that. But um, I think in 2017, I made the decision to run and my opponent had outraised me four to one, had every major legislator's endorsement in our area and people to my face in the Democratic Party said I was a joke, I was wasting my time and I would never win. So um, that was lovely. And uh, you know, that happened. And, I, you know, I announced I was running for office the last week of January. And my husband and I, of course, became pregnant on Valentine's Day. And I was pregnant during the entire campaign. And I knew even though I would be outraised, I knew I would never be outworked. And so I hit the doors, I made the calls while suffering from morning sickness and swollen ankles. But I knew it was at stake. And I knew how important this was that we needed a response to the Trumpian type you know, politics that were being played in Richmond and people's everyday issues like sitting in traffic for two hours and people still working 40 hours a week and bringing home $14,000 a year. That was the status quo and that needed to change. And so you had that. And I went on to win my delegate race uh, while on bed rest, about to give birth to my twins. And I had my husband help bring home the win. And now running for um, governor, I have to say, you know, as a delegate, you know, I was able to pass the Equal Rights Amendment for women's equality, help expand Medicaid, 500,000 Virginians, and build on a lot of that great success. And now running from governor, I have to tell you that, you know, not much has changed. 
So you still hear the not your time, not your turn, right? As a woman, you know, our, you know, our experience is undermined. Um, and, um, you know, it's just those same conversations. So people are still saying, no, you shouldn't run right? We have a status quo candidate that we want to support, um, someone who will continue politics as usual. And, you know, it's no, no, not right now. No, not you. You know, no, because you're a woman. No, because you're a woman of color. No, because you're a mother of uh, three-year-old twin boys. No, because you work multiple jobs. No, because you don't come from wealth um, and power and legacy. Um, and so I heard no in 2017, and I'm hearing no again in 2020. But what people don't know is that I eat no for breakfast. And so that's what's gonna make this so much fun because people will count you out and it will count you, you know, that you can't do these things. But at the end of the day, you know, I go back to my resume, being one of the first women to ever graduate from Virginia Military Institute, right? coming out of Petersburg, Virginia, one of the poorest communities in all of the Commonwealth with one of the lowest uh, you know, rates of accredited schools and one of the most dangerous places to live per capita, you know, that's where I'm from. So breaking down barriers and blazing trails is nothing new to me. And so this is just another thing that you know, sometimes stand in our way as women and women of color and millennials who are trying to do something that's never been done. You know, as the adage say, everything is impossible until it's done. So that's, this is just one more thing that adds to that. So the comparisons are, um, you know, I'm still a woman, still a woman of color. And so people will still say that there's rooms I shouldn't be in and things I shouldn't do. Um, and the thing that is different is that we have a following. People appreciate the fact that um, we understand the everyday struggles that Virginia families face. And we're willing to shake up the status quo and change politics as usual and usher in a 21st century Virginia. And that is um, exciting. And that is something that people can really get behind. And that is exactly how we're going to win. I eat no for breakfast. I'm going to eat that on the fucking walls. <laughs> um, this year has been terrible. 12, 2021 so far. We'll see. But 2020 was terrible. I want to know what the silver lining was for each of you. What's the good thing that when you think back to this year, it's like the, the little glimmer and mostly bad and mostly sad and mostly grief and mostly trauma. What, what is the thing that, that when you look back on this year, you think, well, maybe that was okay. Uh, whoever wants to go first, unmute. It's a hard question. <laughs> um, I'll start. Um, so this is something that was really small and maybe sort of trivial, but um, a few of us um, run for something, endorsed candidates in Michigan who are from Metro Detroit, um, had uh, sort of like a weekly standing bonfire uh, at someone's backyard. And we all kind of hung out together um, and took that time to sort of debrief on what happened for the week and what was going on in the camp in each of our campaigns. And um, that was definitely like it's sort of a trivial thing, um, but it was one of the biggest, brightest spots of the year, I think, for me. After spending, I live alone, and so I spent a lot of time by myself this year. Um, and so having that, like, one moment a week that we could gather together and spend that time sort of talking through what we were experiencing was really, um, really special. And I have to say that um, one of the things I've been really looking forward to getting out of 2020, um, which was a dumpster fire, um, was in 2021, um, I knew that January 27th was coming. And January 27th is the one year anniversary of my resolution passing the Virginia General Assembly, making Virginia the 38th and final state needed to enshrine women's equality into the constitution. And that idea for a bus tour, which actually uh, created the momentum and energy and excitement to make that happen came from Amanda and Ross at Run For Something. And so that's what this is about. It's about the fact that Run For Something creates a community. Um, and when they say that they are open and available, that you can call them at any time. You know, I just remember being at this, you know, dive bar and, um, you know, just saying, hey, I gotta get this thing done. How are we gonna do it? And we're bouncing ideas. And, you know, it was the two of them who was willing to have that conversation and who's willing to, to help well, no matter what it is at any time. And that's what it takes because I remember hearing someone say on a previous 
um, panel that it can be lonely and it can be hard. Um, and people, women, millennials, and people of color running, we're the exception and not the rule. And so any assistance that we can get to help this, make this process better and easy and more streamlined, you know, it's great. And I can say that without Run For Something, I wouldn't be in the position that I'm in today either. So just wanted to give that big shout out and say that that is the silver lining that I have coming into 2021 that I'm really excited about. Two silver linings. One of them is um, just hearing some feedback from the very red parts of my district. I do represent the Bronx and Westchester predominantly. It's a very heavily Democratic district. Um, we definitely have more Democrats than Republicans registered here, but there are definitely pockets that have been like Trump country and they have not been as warm as you can imagine <laughs> whenever I've gone into them or even have wanted to have a conversation and just talked about what exactly were the issues that they cared about and to hear from them at the end of just the campaign in 2020 that they were grateful that we were there to answer the phone or they were grateful that we were able to connect them to whatever it was inside of the government that they were not getting an answer from was a really neat thing because I think for them, it took away this perception that they had of me coming in as this unapologetic progressive, which remains and will remain, but that I wasn't going to put politics in front of service. And I thought that was a really meaningful thing even though we disagree on lots of policy issues. I think the second silver lining was being able to use whatever political capital I have gained in the momentum that we've, all the progress we've done in New York, and then use it to help other insurgent candidates like Mimi Roca, who is now the Westchester County DA, which is amazing, and Jamal Bowman, who is the new member of Congress in the Bronx and Westchester, and who, again, Insurgent candidates were told no, were told to go home, were told they were crazy. I then, when I endorsed them, were, was told again, like, good luck, you have no friends, like, we're, we hate you, you're gonna lose all your donors. And like, again, you just run through that wall and you're like, you know what? No, like this is the right thing to do. These are the people who are gonna get in there and like hit the TNT button of progress and just like make it happen in such an amazing way. And it's been two weeks and we've already seen amazing leadership. And I think that has been really cool because it's not just like win, pass legislation, get in there, run again, win, pass legislation. It's like, what are we gonna do in our with our offices to like help other people open that door? And it's been so neat to watch it happen. And I, I have to agree with that. You know, I, I think it's very much the democratization of civics throughout the pandemic, because obviously there was so much trauma. There is still trauma, um, so much loss. And within that pain, we found power and, and using digital tools like Facebook Live or Zoom Rooms or, or Twitter or Instagram. I mean, we were able to connect with constituents and flirting into across the state and really meaningful ways. I mean, every Friday at 5 p.m. I do a Facebook Live that's a virtual office hour. We answer any question that comes our way. And most of it's unemployment related, but sometimes we get vaccine questions. You know, last night I did a virtual event just on PPP for small businesses. And, and you know, the portals opened up today. So it was like, let us know what your questions are. And so this notion of being able to not only ensure that we're available to more everyday people and that government works for you, we're here to deliver results, answer questions, get you support that you deserve. But it's also about that person's empowerment because I think for many of the folks that we've helped during this pandemic, it's probably the first time they've ever contacted a state lawmaker before. And now they have an idea of why local politics matter. They're not just watching the news for Capitol Hill. They're watching what's happening in Tallahassee. They're watching the Florida channel. They're curious about what I, what I do when I'm in Tallahassee or what are committee meetings. And we've actually created an entire series called ESCA Sessions where we literally just talk about how a bill becomes a law, different healthcare systems, what's gerrymandering, so that our Floridians are their own advocates so that not only could hold me accountable, but also other elected officials across the state. And hopefully they will also be inspired to run for office one day too. Um, okay, I have my final question for the four of you. Um, answer it in like one tweet or less amount of words. What's your advice to someone thinking about running for office? Um, I would say to ask for guidance, but trust your gut. I would say don't overthink it. 
you know what's right for you and no one is ever going to be able to answer that question better than you so you might be able you might be getting advice from people and it might be helpful as a data point but you are the ultimate person who knows the answer to that question and so to to really to add this point i think it's the most important part of running for office is you feeling that you know you could do it I think um, do your research and know who your people are. I think, you know, obviously going into this um, for me, I felt, I felt like I really needed as much information as possible before I made that decision. Um, but then also having a crew of friends and family around me. Um, and it wasn't, didn't have to be an enormous group of people um, in terms of my, you know, really my personal people that were really strong for me throughout the entire process, but know who your people are so you can lean on them when times get tough. Yeah, I would say run. Um, we need as many diverse voices to not only be at the table, but people who will shake the table, right? And uh, make real change and movement. And just remember, everything is impossible until it's done. Oh, Sandra, Anna, Jen, Mari, thank you guys so much for being part of the Run for Something family, for joining us for our fourth anniversary celebration event, um, for just being incredible leaders in New York and Florida and Virginia and Michigan, both in your states and nationally. It is, um, it's just the fucking best to root for you all and to see you succeed. And I can't wait to one day vote for, honestly, all four of you for higher office, whether it's in New York or nationally, uh, it's gonna be awesome. Um, thank you guys for making the time tonight. Uh, we will send around to everyone joining this event some information about all the panelists um, you met. Uh, in our last final goodbye, as Alessandra and Anna and Jen and Mari whew, away from the screen and perhaps Ross comes back, um, I just wanna say thank you. Uh, today, National Run for Office Day, in the last 24 hours alone, more than 1,800 people signed up to tell us they want to run for office. More than 1,800 people in 24 hours have raised their hands to tell us they want to run. Um, and just to put that in context, in the, I remember at the beginning, I told you in the first week of Run for Something, 1,000 people signed up. And we thought that was crazy because look what Trump had done. 1,800 people today, and there's still like four or five hours left to go before midnight. That's what the future is. That's the leaders who are going to take on insurrectionists and protect democracy and protect a woman's right to choose and end police brutality and restore uh, faith in government. That's the future. And I have feel such a strong responsibility to those 1800 people and the 65, 66,000 others who've signed up with us. Run for something has to be there for them. We have to, we have no choice. <laughs> they need our help and we need to be here. And as you've heard each of our panelists talk about tonight, our help is invaluable. Um, so if you are able to make another donation or a contribution to run for something, we will follow up tomorrow uh, with information on how to do that. You can also just go to runforsomething.net slash build uh, or slash donate um, and make a contribution, uh, make it recurring even better. It means so much to us and will help us be there for the, at this point, nearly 70,000 young people who've raised their hands to say, to say they wanna run. Uh, before we close out, I just wanna say again, thank you. This would not be possible without you, uh, without your generosity, your time, your talent, your treasure, and without the Run for Something team, um, both the folks who've been on staff over the last four years and the ones currently, uh, this is a joy. We have the best jobs in politics and I, I feel that way. I hope you feel that way. Um, and we are really lucky to get to do this and we're lucky to get to do it together, both the staff and every volunteer, candidate, donor, lurker, everyone. Ross, anything else? Just thank you. Thank you again for everything. Uh, I, you know, Amanda said this earlier, but if you had asked me four years ago on, you know, inauguration day in 2017, would we be celebrating our four year anniversary with almost 70,000 folks who had signed up to run for office and over fi about 1500 endorsements? I would have thought you were, I, I wouldn't have believed you. Um, this is amazing. This work is amazing. I feel really honored that I get to do this work. And I feel really honored that I get to work with the whole Run for Something team and the entire Run for Something community to do it. So thank you for an incredible four years and we're really excited for another four years another 40. So <laughs> um, have a good night, everyone. I hope you enjoy inauguration tomorrow and take a moment to really take it in because we have survived it and we deserve it. Have a good night, everyone.